Well, 20 years ago when I would talk about relationships between man machine and man and man and uh, potential futures that we face, I would start with a slide like this. Because I saw science fiction, I saw Astro Boy and Terminator as explorations of extremal boundary conditions for the ways in which we might relate to machines and extremal in opposite ways and from different cultures. So very interesting to think about. That was 20 years ago of wayfinding this space. But I don't do that anymore. And I don't do that because we live in a society where, as has been talked about today already, I believe uh, current events are actually overtaking our imagination. We're being superseded by the inventions of corporate America, essentially. And, of course, the military industrial complex, as we've talked about as well. And so today I talk about present occurrences in robotics, the newest innovations online now, and the near future, what's possible very soon from now that I possibly can for the singularity. So, <laughs> having said that, the way I'm laying out my remarks today is using four words that I'll introduce to you one at a time that I think build upon each other. It's sort of like a wedding cake, um, like the layers of the wedding cake, not the whole cake. And these four words actually have already been mentioned multiple times by my, my prior colleagues and speakers, so it's perfect, I think, as, as uh, a wayfinding that we can use in this talk. And the first one I want to start with is the concept of identity. Because if I think about ethics and the ways in which robot technologies today, taken broadly, uh, inform our understanding of human identity, in fact, I believe we have interesting threats that we face as a, to the question of who we are. And they come from robotics. And yes, I'm going to start with science fiction after I told you I won't. Because in fact, the first thing we need to understand is the degree to which modern science, modern AI technology and deep learning are changing our own comprehension of who we are the degree to which we have agency or autonomy or free will. And this is really problematic. This is a scene from the very beginning of Blade Runner, one of my favorite movies, in which a gentleman is using a Voigtkamp machine, a fictional machine that looks at things like the micromuscular movements of the person sitting here on the other side, reverse camera view, trying to figure out if they are a replicant, an artificial being, or a real human being. And what they're doing is they've determined that we can actually tell the difference between replicants and humans by looking at the minutiae, the details of how they move their face. That was science fiction. I mean, what's odd is that today we have these strides being made which enable us to actually be able to consider the possibility of reading humans' minds in a broad way. There's a movie called Justice's Mind that's a work based, not a very good movie, but it was based on the work that's being done at Carnegie Mellon at the University of Pittsburgh. In that work, they took dozens of people and put them in an MRI machine, a functional MRI machine, which takes scans of the active neurons uh, based on hydrogen over time. So you have sort of time-lapse imagery of electrical signals in the brain. And they put these people in this machine, they have a, a mirror here, and they show you words. And they have you think about those words. And they're words that have some abstraction to them. Love, peace, kissing, chair, all sorts of words. And you think. And they train a massive neural network based on the brains that you've scanned on how you think when you see these words. And now here's where phenomenology gets seriously in trouble. Because then they take one of you who was never in the machine, and they put you in the machine now. And they ask you to think about one of these words on a list, and they can tell which word you're thinking about. Scary, because it suggests that the inner workings of that sanctum here actually has similarity between people. How weird is it that if we come from different cultures, that if we are thinking about the word love, the same neural systems are firing when we've been taught for decades that if the small child, developmentally speaking, is establishing all these connections anew based on their particular experiences. So how is it that a machine can read our minds? It, in a way, uh, can etch away at the sense of agency that we have in a fairly provocative manner. Now, I'm not exactly going to talk about the singularity, but what I do want to talk about is the rhetoric surrounding the singularity that comes from these very kinds of studies. Because there are a number of scientists and a number of billionaires who've been convinced by this, that humans are essentially machine-readable entities. And as soon as you decide that we're machine-readable, you can jump to some interesting natural conclusions. I want to talk in particular about Boris Itzkov. He's the guy who's not the Dalai Lama in this picture. <laughs> he is a founder of a project called the 2045 Project, and he's a Russian oligarch, which means he has lots of money and he poisons whoever he wants. 
So in this project, what he says is we know that by 2045, machines will surpass the level of intelligence that humans have. Or I have a really exciting proposition for us all. We should, by 2045, design robotic vessels and then take all the humanitarian aid agencies that help those who are in poverty, those who are refugees, and those who have uh, serious issues with hunger. And we can actually solve all of those problems with one fell swoop. Because since we know by 2045 we have super intelligent machinery, and the machinery can help us design robot vessels, what we can start doing in 2045, which is so exciting, is we can actually start people's consciousnesses into these machines, thereby resolving the problem of hunger and poverty and pestilence. So all the horsemen of the apocalypse disappear behind the horizon because, in fact, we've downloaded everybody. Now, you and I may consider this to be mass murder, but in fact, he considers it salvation. And it's a real project. I'll just give you one quote from him from the New York Times. He maintains that his avatars do not just end world hunger because a machine means maintenance, but not food, but that they would also usher in a more peaceful and spiritual age when people can stop worrying about the petty anxieties of day-to-day living. Times remarked on this entire thing and reports on it without irony, without question. And it's really fascinating to read that the journalists talk about this with a sense of excitement about 2045. I bring that up with you because what's important to understand isn't so much that what they're talking about is hogwash. It is, but don't worry about that. What matters is the degree to which billionaires today are pouring their resources into solving this problem, and journalists today are reporting on it as an exciting and possible future for humanity, which is. And those are, of course, all resources that we could be using for some greater good. <laughs> we're thinking about our identity as people. These are all ways in which our identity is threatened because the essence of who we are and the kind of dignity we'll have in the future is being reformulated around us by ideas that are actually fallacious. But those ideas are becoming the dominant theme in our culture. And that, I believe, uh, discredits the way policymakers will act in the future, but also the way publics will react as changes do come under our feet. It's not all the case that our changes in identity because of machinery are bad. And I want to show you this one picture because it's so powerful to see examples where, for instance, using targeted muscle innervation, you can take somebody who has no arms, give them robotic arms that actually feel musculature on your chest, and have those robot arms be so fully incorporated into that person that in the matter of literally a few days, they start believing in those arms as a natural extension of their body. That idea, that mimesis, where cyborgs are resolved from people and machines put together. Those machines, by the way, with microprocessors, so they're doing decision-making jointly with the human. But the idea of a human re-identifying themselves as a homunculus that includes humanity and machinery together, that's coming. And it's, in some cases, powerfully good. I'm going to try really hard to temper myself with good news in there as I go down my uh, dystopian path. So I'm uh, talented at thinking about I like that, I guess. Uh, so identity will change. And the important bit here is it will change in multiple ways. but the reality of how our identity is being changed is in fact overtaken, is subsumed by a kind of uh, hyper-techno-optimistic vision that I believe clouds our vision both in terms of funding and in terms of public outreach and public participation in science. I'm going to introduce the second word now that builds on identity. Because if identity is changing, there's something that's absolutely critical to our identity as people that is changing just as rapidly with it. And this has to do again with dignity, but it has to do with the reason we get up in the morning. And it has to do with the reason we get tired during the day, and that's labor. One of the fundamental ways in which technology, particularly robotics and AI technology, is changing us is that it's changing what labor is. And it's changing it in really oddball ways. I want to start with recapture. When you wanted to go to a concert, you'd buy a ticket to the concert by going online and buying it. And yes, I'm older than some people here who don't realize that you used to go to a box office and buy it. But those days are long gone. But in fact, over time, what happened is we had to prove that we aren't robots. So we'd go to a website to buy the tickets, and recapture would appear and ask you a question. And often it was a numeral or a word, and we would have to type in the correct word. The reason is because the company we capture was being paid by the New York Times to digitize their entire archive of print articles. But the optical character recognition systems were failing on some of the words. 
So recapture were chosen to you because you're human. And you would figure out the correct way to spell that word. And they'd test it on a thousand people and make sure that they agree by vote. And then recapture gets this really cool benefit. They digitize the word, which means they can send a digital version to the New York Times, and New York Times pays them for it. And Ticketmaster also pays with capture money because you just proved you're a human being because you got that word right. So they're actually making double money on you. Isn't that cool? And using literally hundreds of thousands of minutes of humans' times around the Earth to do that. Now, it gets a little spookier because they ran out of New York Times archives. They actually digitized all of them now. What they started doing is they start showing you, maybe some of you have seen this, this, and say, what's that number? So what they're showing you is an image from Google Street View of a house. The problem is sometimes they can't tell which house number it is. So now the physical world has become glued to the digital world through digital labor. You're actually helping recapture now identify people's private property by identifying that house number. So now they're getting paid by Ticketmaster and by Google, and you're helping them identify private property. So in the future, Google Maps can do a better job of taking you there. Or any kind of targeted marketing can happen there. So again, it's digital labor. And you are the digital laborers, and you don't get paid for it. In fact, it taxes your time, and they get multiply paid for it. In fact, they can sell and resell this information multiple times. Now, there are strange boundary examples of this that I have to bring up before I get to the really scary case. Because digital labor inherently changes the concept of labor from something we do by choice to something we do because of the matter of convenience. Not our convenience, but the convenience of those that have hegemonic power in our society. And that's a really scary place to be. Uh, McDonald's has lots of power in society, so I have to show a picture of McDonald's, of course. Um, you have McDonald's in Canada? <laughs> so this is an interesting example. Hyperactive Bob is a vision system. And the problem McDonald's had was Short order cooks have to make extra french fries all the time and hamburgers. <coughs> because if the line gets long, people don't pull it and wait in line. So they want the line to be short. But to make the line short, you have to make food before it's been ordered. But if you make food before it's been ordered, you have to waste it because you might guess wrong. So they needed to magically know what you're going to order before you've ordered it. How do you do that? Easy. You put a computer vision system in the parking lot of McDonald's that looks at the cars pulling in. And the computer vision system is connected to the point of sales register in McDonald's. And over time, does deep machine learning to learn what cars order. And it turns out Toyota Priuses order fish fillet sandwiches. <laughs> and that Hummer in the back, that orders the supersized Big Mac <laughs> and the supersized fries. And amazingly, it works. So Hyperactive Bob demonstrated in Pennsylvania that they saved money for McDonald's by shortening the line, causing more people to get in line and eat food that kills you gradually. At the same time, the short order cook cooks more accurately the right food. This is behavior analytics. We started talking about this because Kathy brought up the word predictive data. The idea of behavioral analytics or predictive data that allows machine learning systems to embody a level of information on our future, to predict our behavior over time in a way that was really not possible before with simple human engineering, that is a powerful sea change in how we can control humans. And so when you look at Intel Corporation, for instance, the ability that they have to track microfacial gestures and pupil diameter and pupil direction on a face has turned into something absolutely stunning today, where you have digital advertising boards now that are about to become sold that have cameras built into them. And when you approach it, that digital advertisement can categorize you, your gender, your probable race, and your age, and even your social status from the shoes and pants you're wearing. And then it can decide what to advertise to you. And it can do tens of millions of experiments every day to determine across the country which advertisements work for which subcategories of humanity. And they're connected to the point of sale systems in the store so they can tell what you're buying. So now what happens is massive marketing experimentation, AB split comparisons, that allow a digital system to create a never before seen structure from human archetype to behavior. And that means that you have just become somebody for whom the company owns a remote control. Because they can push your buttons in just the right way to get you to buy with maximal efficiency just the thing that they have in overstock and inventory. And that's interesting because 
Now, your very behavior in the sidewalk, the way you smile, the way you grimace at the price tag, and what you buy, has become the very digital labor that causes your future to become guided by a greater intelligence, if you will. That intelligence being behavioral marketing. Both your identity, because it starts to question the degree to which you have control over the decisions you make, as well as, of course, who profits. There's something much deeper and sicker about this, of course, which is what happens when politicians get hold of this? What happens in societies that are polarized? When the politician who wins is the one who can do such outstanding behavioral advertising that they can essentially send the right individuated messages to each of us to cause us to vote just the way they want us to. And is the definition of democracy at that point broken? Because even though at some surface level we live in democracy, when each of us is remote controlled by that uh, non-democratic intelligent agent, what remains of the underlying concept of being informed and then making an informed decision? Well, not much. Uh, there's also another odd side to this that's reverse, and I want to share that with you. There's an interesting book Simon Head wrote called Mindless, in which he did a bit of an ethnographic analysis of several companies. One of them was Amazon. And here's what he did in Amazon that was so interesting. He went into Amazon and observed how the warehousing works at Amazon. And what he observed and found, Amazon had started putting GPS trackers on the people in the warehouses. It's like an indoor GPS system. And they noticed some people walking down the corridors would slow down sometimes and then speed up. So Amazon delved into, del delved into this and figured out this is because people were slowing down as they did texting on their phones on the way to the package in the warehouse. So they started having meetings with people and they started accusing them of time theft. Time thievery is now a thing at Amazon. And they charge you for your time theft. How cool is that? But then they went a step further. They started looking at the muscul musculoskeletal system of people as they move in these warehouses. And noticed that, well, people walk like that, and then they bend like that, and they bend down, and pick up the package, and turn around, and they move back. They're wasting all this time. They optimized the musculoskeletal control systems you need and started teaching the people in the warehouses how to move. If you want to pick up that box, what you should really do is you move like this, you scope out the box, twist leg, pull, untwist, and whoa. There you go. Much faster. You can shave easily half a second off the voyage that way. And once you've trained your employees to do that, you pay them on a per box basis. Because now you can justify a higher level of productivity as long as they follow your exact muscular control directions and primitives science fiction. This is today at Amazon. And Simon describes this, but what I find absolutely fascinating about this is that's the one place at Amazon where you haven't roboticized the system because people happen to be cheaper. So instead of roboticizing the system, you roboticize the humans. And so labor gets redefined because the very fact that we can so closely observe labor, labor and use machine intelligence to find savings to labor allows us to take control in a way that changes the relationship. So this uh, takes me to my next word. We've talked about identity and labor and the threats that we see to both of those from AI and robotics. But of course, there's another word we've talked about a lot today, which is agency. And there's a fundamental way in which, as we change the concept of labor for humans, I believe we threaten or we interrogate what agency means to humans. And I think this is a really interesting area in terms of ethics as well. I have to start with the most prosaic example. Sign spinning is a very common technique to make some partial income if you're on the margins of society in Los Angeles. And there's an odd movement afoot, which is robot sign spinners. Now, robot sign spinners are kind of interesting. They can be dressed weird, even more weird than human sign spinners. They can spin the sign all day long. This is, if you're not familiar with sign spinning, it's somebody holding a sign and moving it wildly because it gets people's attention on the road as they're driving by. Car wash and get their hair cut, apparently. Um, I don't drive the other Not familiar with this. But they don't get sick, and the ROI on them is fantastically fast because they cost far less than a human sign spinner, even for a couple of days. It's just a mannequin with some motors. But it's an example of a displacement technology where we're taking what humans do, especially in the margins of society, and we're extracting and removing it, which only exacerbates all the inequality that we have. 
because you just turned an item that was labor income for a human being on margins to capital that's owned by the store owner, who, by the way, had more capital to start with. Now they have even more capital, and every good economist tells us the more capital you have, the more rapid your rate of return on capital. So you just exacerbated the increasing inequality that we have. What fun. Now that same concept of labor replacement applies <coughs> up. And if we merge this concept of agency and changes to agency with identity, we get into some weird spaces. One of the interesting ones is all these welding robots that do the work of people. And one of the nice directions that these have been going recently, okay, nice was completely the wrong word. One of the scary directions they've been going recently is they're getting cheaper to the point where middle machinists, people who work in a machine shop, and our middle lathers and machinists generally are losing their jobs now. And there's an outstanding Atlantic Monthly article about a company in South Carolina undergoing this. Because the robots cost less than six months of labor effort for a middle machinist now. It's not even a five-year ROI anymore. In a year, your robot has already become cheaper than the human that it replaced. So John Dolcinos used to be the CEO of Adept, which makes some of these robot arms. And he has this really interesting rhetoric in his talk more jobs are lost to cheap overseas markets than for robots. So first of all, he's doing this value hierarchy nonsense, saying, no, 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 wait, look at this other problem. It's much bigger, <laughs> right? Um, second thing he's doing is really interesting, too. Robots are used in positions better suited for robots. What's that even mean? Better suited for robots? Robots are a moving boundary condition. We are constantly inventing new things that they can do. There is no better suited to robots. I can invent a robot that does something better than humans. And if it's more expensive, wait two years. It'll be cheaper. And then he says a really beautiful line. People are designed to use their minds. <laughs> oh, so the 90% of society around the world that use these to make money, what exactly will they do in that society? So again, we're reprogramming the concept of labor by the very fact that we create robots that force us into this corner. This corner because there's nothing else left. And that moving boundary is making that corner smaller and smaller, and it's unidirectional. It doesn't stop. Farming is another big example. Uh, we talk a huge amount in America about laborers and immigration. And farming is an example where the Department of Agriculture spends in excessive amounts of money designing orchard systems that will replace the people thoroughly. And the systems are remarkable. They're still expensive, but they're getting cheap fast. But they do all the uh, navigation. They observe all the individual pieces of fruit in orange groves and apple orchards, and they spray the pesticide in unique positions. And yes, it's true, you actually have environmental gains from the system because you use less overall pesticide because you're applying it in a bespoke way. But of course, socially, the ramifications are huge, again, for marginal cost jobs. Last, my favorite example. This was in the New York Times. Uh, and it's, it's one hell of an example. I got to show this with you. Shunde is a region in China, one of the major regions, one of the biggest manufacturing regions in China. And so Shunde has more factories than almost anywhere in China, which means a ton of people in China do internal immigration, migration to Shunde to get a job. So Shunde has a new project. It's called Replacing Humans with Robots. I'm not kidding. That's the name of the project <laughs> in this entire part of China. It's called Replacing Humans with Robots. I mean, it's perfect, right? This is the gentleman who's the economics minister for this part of Shunde. And uh, his goal, as this is a direct quote from his, his interview, our goal is to reduce the number of employees by half. So they asked him, what do you expect the people to do, the half? Right? And he said, well, they should go back to where they came from, find jobs there. And then they asked him, well, why are you doing this project? And here's what he said. Current migrant workers, their endurance and hardworking spirits are inferior <laughs> to the older generations. Subtext, their endurance and hardworking spirits are inferior to robots. Then they asked him without skipping a beat, are other provinces in China running programs like this also? And he said, without skipping a beat, oh yes, all provinces are. Which begs the question, what did the other half supposed to do everywhere? So our agency erodes when the form of dignity, the sense of value that we have to a community, is removed wholesale. And it's a fundamental question that we face. 
My last word for you is power. Um, because the other way in which I think we have a really interesting change of foot has to do with the way the negotiation of power is changing due to the manner in which corporate and government entities can control both robots and AIs and remodulate the relationship we have. And I think it's actually a really big deal. And I've talked about the voting already. That is a, a reprogramming of our relationship to civic life, to our ability to be a citizen and to execute on the underlying task of citizenry. But there's more there than just that. And it has to do a little bit, I think, with this interesting line between AI and robots. And I'm going to kind of blur that line now and go back to tangible robots for a little while. But before I do that, there's one favorite movie that I have. Um, it's a Sidney Lumet movie called Failsafe, based on this book by the same name. And it came out the same year as um, Dr. Strangelove, which was also done this, based on the same book, Failsafe. So they came out at the same time. The difference was Dr. Strangelove became a runaway success. It was funny. Failsafe was not funny at all. Uh, but uh, Henry Fonda did a remarkable job in this movie. And there's a scene in this that I can't play for you because of technology right now. But there's a scene that's yeah, really interesting. Because near the end of the movie, what happens in this movie is that uh, an American plane, which has autonomy on board, making decisions about when to drop a nuclear bomb, has had a mistake. The autonomy is, mis is, is doing the wrong thing. It is flying toward Moscow. It's going to drop a bomb on Moscow. Okay? And America tries everything to stop this bomber, and they can't. Because it has a fail -safe. It has a system designed so that once it's decided to drop the bomb, you can't stop it. So that you can't overwrite it. Right? So you can't hack it, ironically. So the, the devil's bargain is made between Henry Fonda, President of the United States, and the premier of, of the Soviet Union, which is that, all right, we're going to give you permission to drop a nuclear bomb on New York City. This is the only way out of this. So we're going to destroy Moscow, and we're going to destroy New York City at the same time. And then we're, we're done, right? <laughs> That's it. Just two bombs. That's all. So it's a beautiful movie. There's a scene in which, at the end, the premier says, this is... A shame what's happening, but uh, of course we have to remember no one's responsible for this happening. And it becomes a, a play about responsibility at that point. Henry Fonda interrupts him and says, no, you're wrong. I disagree. We are responsible for this because we're the ones who decided to put machines, to put automation in charge of a decision as weighty as this. We are responsible. And the discussion and the debate really becomes an interesting one about the question of the boundary of responsibility and blame that we face as we um, energize systems around us with the power to make decisions that have that much material consequence for us. That's power, right? That's rethinking the, the power relationship in society when an autonomous system has the power to do something that that's, that's that material. But it's a good metaphor for all the smaller ways in which we are exceeding power to machines. And I'll just start as one example, Watson. We've been reading about Watson. And it's absolutely fascinating to read the texts which say things like, well, Watson reads more articles than any doctor ever can. Therefore, it's a better doctor. <laughs> we are, even the doctors, quoted in saying that themselves, proposing a situation in which the power structure of medicine puts Watson on top. It's not a tool. It's not a staple gun to be used by the doctor. It is the one who makes the right decision, and I become the tool to effectuate that decision, just like the dude in Amazon who's getting the boxes. So that power relationship change, I think, is really fascinating. There's a deeper and even scarier thing, I think, that's going on, which is interesting. It has to do with this concept that we can create uh, forms of humanity out of non-humanity. And um, this is a picture that has one human, Hiroshi Ishimuro, and one robot in it. And I show you the picture. I'm friends with Hiroshi because I want to tell a story about him. He makes these things called geminoids that are hyper-realistic. And yes, they're still uncanny and scary. They're pretty horrible. And you can tell which one the scary one is and which is the nice one that you'd like to talk to in the bar. <laughs> but the interesting bit is he makes, for instance, this that he puts in a department store window. If you're familiar with it in Tokyo, you might have a department store, and you pay an actress to wear beautiful clothes and be in a department store window. So there's labor for you again. Mm -hmm. But he makes these and puts them in the department store window instead. 
And I got to share a keynote with him at a conference a few years ago. And I asked him, why you do this? Why is it that you're replacing females in the department store window with your robot? And I was expecting something about bad labor conditions to come up, right? Something about how well nobody should do that job. But that's not what he said. What he said is because those department store windows are celebrating the most perfect sense of beauty of the human form. And I can do a better job of that than actual humans. Yeah. So we are facing this really interesting point where we have real roboticists building real robots under the motivation that in terms of power relationship, they're creating a more ideal human. This is post-humanism in a funny way. Um, and can I show you a picture of it? There it is. That's one example. This one actually does poetry. And so I'm going to show you some other videos, but you can actually get videos of that online singing. And, and yes, it's completely uh, spooky to watch. It doesn't make you feel good at all. Fundamentally, this gets to a, a notion that we can improve on the world and that we have such incredible engineering talent we can improve on the world in any way we wish. And I actually love the title of this book because it's so absurd that way. Um, Jane McGonagall tells this story as well in the world of VR and says, you know, if we want our kids to really learn, if we want them to get really good at being the best citizens they can be, our world is too imperfect. People shouldn't grow up in this messy physical world. Let's <coughs> invent the right virtual world that's better than reality. And yes, I am caricaturing her to some degree, but it's for real that the name of the book is Reality is Broken. So we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it by creating a virtuality. That, again, presupposes that the relationship humanity has to reality renegotiates our position by virtue of the physical, tangible robotics that we can create. And that changes society. Now, we've already heard about war. We've already heard about these kinds of machines. I just want to echo this concept of non-mutuality that you pointed out, or asymmetry that you pointed out. Um, Kathleen and Lucy both brought this up. Fundamentally, what's at play here to me, from an ethical point of view, is that if you look at conflict around the world, some of the most horrid conflicts we have are cases where there's a lack of parity in power. So you have power structures that don't have any parity at all, and as a result, we have a sense of extreme injustice on two sides. And that's exactly the same in Yemen right now, for instance, which is close to my country, Iran. So in fact, the robot as warfighter, whether it's remote control or autonomous, creates ever greater degrees of disparity of power. And uh, there's a piece in P.W. Singer's old book, Wired for War, where he tells a story of interviewing people in Afghanistan about being blown up. And they say, well, we know the US is working with Satan. <laughs> and say, well, how do you know that? And they say, oh, because the house is there one moment and then it's just gone. There's no airplane, nothing. So they must be working in the city. It's the only way. So the very fact that we have such an extreme level of disparity with the Afghani people <laughs> creates a situation in which it's completely acceptable for them to decide we are Satan. Because they don't have any rational explanation for how we could be doing the black magic that we do. And, of course, that has incredible negative repercussions for the way we're viewing that part of the world. Now, there's another side to this, which is the very fact that these robots exist and can have pseudo-social interactions with us also places upon us this weird reverse possibility where we are abusive toward the robots. And I'm going to claim that this, this is this strange case of birefringence. The robots can be in a superiority conflict with us, and it can be simultaneously in an inferiority complex with us. So let me show you the inferiority complex a little bit, because it's interesting. And I believe it actually affects human-human relations directly. This is a machine. I don't remember if it's called big dog, medium dog, or little dog, but it's the dog. And I want you to just look at how they demonstrate how cool it is. They demonstrate its coolness through violence. And you'll see another shot outside. This is how a company, in this case, shows you how awesome their robot is. Here's another example. This is a case where, again, I want you to see the way the human interacts with the robot and the way you feel about that interaction. The robot's humanoid, so you start to develop a sense of empathy for it if you've never seen it before. And this human with that hockey stick, to me, starts looking threatening, bullying, 
I want him to lose, right? I want him to go away. And everything he's doing is violent. And we're okay with this. We're okay with this because that thing is a robot. Even though we start ascribing agency to it. We start seeing that robot as more than a simple machine. Because we can see that it has goals that are being stimulated by the person. The reason I show you those pictures is because we are going to have robots pervade society gradually. And the issue that really bothers me here is that the way we treat those robots will necessarily be different from the way we treat other human beings. And yes, this goes right back to colonial slavery and the whole question of how we treated other human beings. Are we actually creating an entire class of thing that we are going to find acceptable societally to abuse? And as we abuse it, two things will happen, I believe. One, that it will poison the way we interact with humans. It's un acceptable for me to believe that we can learn to abuse one form of thing and not have it poison the way we, we interact with another form of thing. Us. And second, these objects, like Hiroshi Shiguro's robots, are going to become more and more indistinguishable from us. If this was wearing construction clothing and working on a construction site, would you know that it's a human? Probably not, if it has a helmet on. And would you speed past it because you'd decide, ah, it's just a robot. If I hit it with my rearview mirror, no big deal. And then what will happen next time when there's a mixed group of five humans and five robots at that construction site? These get into boundary conditions that we're unprepared for as a society, we're unprepared for ethically, and the regulators, they're so far behind, it's laughable. And that was before Trump. So now it's beyond laughable. But that's where we're headed. And that's what's interesting about the human-human relationship we're going to have in the future, in my opinion. Now, I have to give you some of the... Uh, <laughs> or so of, of the silver lining, I guess, the silver lining on the cloud. Because the very same way that robotic technologies are creating hegemonic power structures that I think threaten society, the identity of society, the way we think about it, and the ways in which we'll act with each other, at the same time, they can empower any particular community of practice in really powerful ways. And I just take a few examples. One is 3D printing, right? The very fact that we have the ability to create something, yes, it means somebody in a country where guns are outlawed can 3D print a plastic gun. That's right, and that's a problem. But it also means that an entire community of designers around the world can design and share uh, these devices, prostheses, for people who have rapid growth. So then you can reprint prostheses as people grow, and there's something like 10,000 places around the world now sharing the same designs for these and printing them in schools. So that inversion of power also enables a kind of groundswell of innovation to happen. And I want to grant that because I don't want to overlook that. At the Create Lab, we try and encourage this. And we ask this question, how do we rethink the relationship people have to technology so that we stop going down the path we're going down right now, which is that fundamentally technology is in the surface of capitalism and demography, right? The technology supports power and invigorates economic growth and power. So our answer is start with kids. <laughs> so easy to say. And to, to ask the question then, okay, so how do we reprogram the relationship children have to technology? And there, I'm going to show you a couple of quick examples and, and close. If you think about the way we introduce children to the creative arts, we do it by taking arts as raw material. We take paint, clay, brushes, and introduce children to those individuated elements. And they act creative with those elements and become intimate with art and the creative process. But we don't do that with technology. Instead, we spend millions of dollars developing cognitive orthotics, cognitive bespoke systems to teach you math, living inside an iPad as an app. So your relationship as a child to technology today is one in which you're using an app as designed, and it's a black box, just like an app on a You have no idea how that app works. You just know how to swipe your hand and push buttons on the screen. And the games are embarrassingly poor. There's a fraction game. I asked Sesame Street, director of Sesame Street, what's the best math app out there? And he told me about this one game, I downloaded it. It teaches you fractions. It's got fractions falling down your iPad screen. There's a number line at the bottom. And you have to twist and turn your iPad screen to get it to fall in the correct place and number line. And once the fraction's halfway down the screen, if you haven't gone in the right direction, it just goes in the right direction itself and drops down. <laughs> That's the entire app. That's the level of sophistication we have with educational technology. So we tried to, to change that. We created a kit called the Children's Innovation Project Kit. 
we take individual elements of electronics from a blade switch to a light bulb to an LED to a battery. And we take really simple lines with alligator clips on the end. And we do this slow learning thing where over the course of a year, we have four-year-olds and five-year-olds create circuitry and draw it and sketch it and feel the wood grain all tumbled with beeswax, of course, so can't give you splinters. And they develop in the classroom a language for cause and effect. And at the end of that class, after that first year, we give them goodwill toys, electronic toys that are a buck at goodwill. And they take them apart because now they know how to use Phillips screwdrivers, which they didn't have access to at home. And they're careful because they understand the materiality of wires. They don't break the wires. And then you hear four-year-olds saying, there's a potentiometer. And oh, there's a really high ohm resistor. Oh, there's a microprocessor. Then they clip in with their alligator clips and make a new toy with the innards of this toy. So to them, the object has ceased being a black box that has a single function and has become potential. The potentiality to create whatever you want with it. That reprograms a sense of the power relationship they have to technology. But I think we have to do that massively to reprogram what technology is to people if we're going to be in a situation where we don't have a few companies from billions of dollars into making something that's basically behavioral analytics turbocharged. So that's what really bothers me about society. I'm going to show you one more example of that, but before I do, just to give you a sense of the way we think about this on the positive and what role technology should have in terms of the development of fluency. I look at it kind of bottom up. We need our children and our adults to learn to have curiosity. We'll go to something good Aristotle said, wonder. We need people to wonder about the world. And that inquiry in today's world, topos, choosing something to care about, is data fluency. Because in today's world, we have a sea of information out there. And what people need is the ability to sense make, to know how to ga gather the information and have a question worth asking. Then we need a way to create a story, which means learning rhetoric, creating a narrative, and developing an emotional attachment to pathos, having something you actually care about. And that's what I think of as technological fluency, not literacy, not the ability to program your VCR but the ability to hijack information and use it to create a narrative that you care about that nobody else has created yet. It's like the deep sense of innovation being about making something new from something known. That concept of innovation. And last, I think we need this concept of ethos, creation of personal identity. We need people to then take that information, that robot they've built, right, if it's a robot, and advocate for change with it. So they're directly engaging with society in an attempt to make the world better. So that's the kind of uh, the other wedding cake, I guess, that we have for you, which is how we think about trying to change society. And I'll show you one final example, which is uh, an example of us doing that in a community in Pittsburgh, where they had the highest asthma rates in the state of Pennsylvania. They have a coke plant there. That's a plant where you take coal and you reduce it to coke to make steel there. And it's a Russian-owned coke plant. It was putting out massive amounts of pollution. People had to sweep the soot off their porches every morning. It's that bad. And all summer long, when it's blisteringly hot, this low-income community can't open their windows because it smells too bad and because people cough and asthmatics bees. And they would tell the federal government about this. This is in the good old days of Obama and the EPA. They would complain to the EPA, and the EPA said, well, we can't prove where the smell came from, so we can't do anything because there's no way to prove smell. So we made a massive robotic network of cameras around the plant. And we made a machine learning algorithm, a vision algorithm, that the community uses to identify every time an illegal plume of smoke comes off the plant. And then we create a smell reporting app that the community uses to report when it stinks and overlay it with a wind direction app that shows exactly where the wind was from when it stank. And overlay on that all the federal sensors that measure air quality there and a bunch of internal sensors we put in people's homes. So it's basically as if you're trying to fight the paucity of information with so much information that it's hard to deny the causal link. And then we brought the EPA division coordinator out, and the community, not us, the community got in front of him, showed him their interface, and showed him more than 10,000 examples of illegal plumes coming off, co-located with smells and particles. <laughs> and the story was so powerful, they shut the plant down. And the community doesn't sweep the soap off their porches anymore. That's this idea of inquiry to narrative to engagement and advocacy. But it's a story that took years. <laughs> Right? It's the wicked problem of a, uh, architecture. And what's more, it took a huge amount of engagement with the public for the public to own that and run with it. 
but it's the same exact technologies of deep data mining, computer vision, analytics, and, uh, and robotics, and surveillance. It's the same exact technologies that are being used basically against you all today. You're just reformulating how you use them, like Lego pieces. So I'll stop on this slide. This is Rachel. She is the uh, replicant that uh, the protagonist in Blade Runner falls in love with. And the reason I end with her is because there's another even more insidious issue that will be on our horizon. And it relates to one of the questions we got earlier, which has to do with, it has to do with authenticity, actually, with the question of what is real and what is not. What are the ways in which every roboticist is working and hewing towards greater engagement, as well as all these digital behavioral folks? Is that they want to make sure they maximize the degree to which they can control your dopamine receptors. And this is kind of like the video game people used to do, right? They made the video games have just the right level of feedback and reward for you that you were so tilted out on dopamine that you were an addict, that you had to keep playing and you couldn't stop. That's how they make the most money. And behavioral marketing and advertising happens the same way. But what's become scary is how good they're getting at this. Rachel didn't even know that she's a replicant. And we know that because of the interactions she had with the protagonist in this movie. She thought she was a human being. But there's one step shy of that that I believe we're headed towards, which is really interesting, which is that we're going to have robotic systems around us that are going to be very, very good at simulating <coughs> affect, emotion. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking much, much better than Kismet. They're going to be so good at simulating affect, and you can watch movies like Robot and Frank to see examples of this a little bit, that we won't know whether it's a simulation or real. And unless we're really good cognitive psychologists, we probably don't even know how to tell the difference between the two. So we're going to start being in the situation where we encounter machinery that appears to have a soul. And it's going to be hard for us to have the expertise to discriminate. And we're going to start wondering whether the machine itself even knows, like Rachel, whether it has a soul or not. That's uncharted territory. And it's unclear when we offer that much agency, when we lay upon the machine's feet that much agency or soulhood, it's unclear what our rights and responsibilities are at that point in terms of how we treat that machine. Again, uncharted territory. And given the way we're going right now with technology innovation, we're going to go there way before we think about this in terms of public discourse. Something that really bothers me. And I'll stop with that. <laughs>